and we're uh, last the last time we met for us there was a Tuesday. Uh, we discussed about the uh Esau entering the uh the uh Mount the, the Midbar Sinai, the Sinai Desert, and the preparation that the people had in anticipation of the giving of the Torah. The, they were told not to touch the mountain and uh, they had to keep the distance from it and uh, they had to purify them so they were they were immersed in the mikvah which came from i believe the Mayim of miriam this uh well of water that supplied the people with water as they traveled through the desert so that was a little preparation uh, uh in anticipation of the giving of the torah mount sinai okay and it says the following, verse 20. By Yered Hashem al Har Sinai Arocha. And Hashem came down upon Mount Sinai at the top of the mountain. By Ikra Hashem Moshe al Roshahar. And, and Hashem called out to Moshe from the top of the mountain. By Yal Moshe. Moshe ascended the mountain. Okay. And the Gemara makes the following comment. Although it's, it says that God descended upon Mount Sinai, it doesn't mean the divine presence actually touched the mountain, or or maybe means there was a distance between God and the mountain. What do you think? When it says when God descended upon Mount Sinai. Okay, so the Gemara says the following. Tanya, we learn the price of Gemara and Sukkot. Gemara says, Rabbi Yossi Omer, Rabbi Yossi makes the following comment. We say that verse in Hallel many times. The heavens belongs to God, but ours is son of the Adam. And the land, the earth, was given to us. So, but even though, so if that's the case, they were saying the heavens belong to God, how could God come around and come down to the earth? So it says, uh, and the Gemara says, so, so how do I understand the verse that said that God descended upon Mount Sinai if there, he's always, if the heaven is his domain? So Gemara answers, the Mala He didn't touch the mount, whatever, the, whatever it means by the Shekhinah, by the divine presence, whatever that is, it did not touch the mountain, but rather there was a distance of 10 Tavachim, which is 10 um, handbreadths. From the mountain till the actual uh, of the uh, the presence of God. Yeah. Uh, also, you know that's it's one other one other place where we talk about tent vachim. When it comes to sukkah, you build a sukkah. What is the shortest measurement that a sukkah has to be? Tent vachim. Tent vachim. And why is that true? You can't have a sukkah, you cannot have a sukkah less than tent vachim. Because God does not come down below ten tzvachim, so He's above it. God's uh, uh, God's presence. That's why the minimum sukkah measurement has to be at least ten tzvachim, and God is above that. Okay. So when, when we talk about God descending upon Mount Sinai, it doesn't mean that the presence of God actually touched Mount Sinai, but rather there was a gap of approximately ten tzvachim. And uh, Tefach is approximately about like, four inches or something like that. So we're talking about uh, 40 inches or so. Something exactly uh, what a Tefach is, a handbreadth, I suppose it depends upon each person, but I think it's approximately four inches. Okay. Let's go further. Now, uh, verse 21. Vayoma Hashem al Moshe, and then God said to Moshe at this point, Reiko Eid Ba'am. Now, warn them again. Warn them about what? Not to touch the mountain. Ten years, Sue Elisha goes, maybe they'll be pushing uh, to see God better. The rose, the you know, and Rob, and, and, and unfortunately, very bad consequences can happen. Uh, if they, as, he, as the Torah said before, they should not touch the mountain because they will be, uh, they be they'll die. Okay, so it has to be warned again. Uh, uh, God says the most raid or warm the people warn the people again. because maybe the Christian see God, the ropes will not found in rub and many casualties will happen. Okay. Verse 22. 
וגם הכהנים ניגשים על שם נזכר קדוש, ואולסו הכהנים will come closer to God, make sure that they sanctify themselves in all the preparations, and he froze for him Hashem because we don't want any casualties to happen. Now, there's a, what pro, you should be asking a question. That, what's the problem? What's the problem? Ah, kohanim. that's it. How could they say the Kohanim? They weren't Kohanim then. What, what was, who served in the, when they offered the sacrifice to God? Who was the ones who did it? Before they the had Bukhar. Kohanim. The Bakar, the firstborn. So what does it mean over here Dam Kohanim? The Ra that's why Rashi is quick to point out. So look at that Rashi. Afa Bakhor Rose, Chavodobahem. And me, even though the word Kohanim uh, is mentioned, the Rashi is quick to point out that it means the first the firstborn. Because until that point, Kohanim, which came from Shaver Levi. They weren't around any. They weren't. They weren't designated as as uh, as those to officiate the sacrifice. All firstborn were allowed to. So it seems like that besides Moshe going up to Har Sinai, there was a uh, a certain level that the firstborns were allowed to go up, or even Aaron. Not all the way. Moshe went all the way on the mountain. But each one had a limitation, and the majority of people had a. There was a distance between the mountain and themselves. Okay. So why is the word yeah. Kohanim used? Uh, I don't. It's a good question. Uh, the um, the uh, all the Gemara brings it down. And Zerachim says, Rabbi Yochan ben Broker Omer, Zuprishas Bechoros. This is the separation of the first point. Maybe the Torah is just trying to tell us that the Bechoros were considered the Kohanim at that time, before the, the actual Kohanim came about. They are, they are, they are, they officiate as a Kohanim in the future will be officiating. Perhaps that's the reason. <clears throat> uh, I don't have any other answer. Uh, but Rashi says the same thing. And this Rashi says, although they use, when it says, the way Rashi understands it, means that all the, all, all, and also the firstborn, and the Goshim who came, who came close to God, meaning they offered sacrifices. They also don't have a right to go entirely up the mountain, only to a certain distance, a small part. So there was a few exceptions. Moshe went there, entirely went up on the mountain. Aaron went to a certain level on the mountain. And those who officiated offering the sacrifice, who were the firstborn, they also uh, were allowed to go to a certain level uh, upon the mountain. But majority of the people were not permitted to touch it, not to go close. Mm. Okay. Uh, further, uh, verse twenty-three. Vayome Moshe El Hashem. Moshe said to Hashem, "Lo yichal am lalo sal har Sinai." Moshe at this point said, thinking to himself, well, "There's no reason for me to do that. The the people are not going to do it. They're not going to ascend the mountain." Ki atzohe dosa bonu lemor because you were. You already warned him about it previously. We looked at the Pesukim before. We had that last time we met. That he, he told him that they cannot come close, cannot uh, come out to the mountain. He already said, make it a boundary between the mountain and themselves. So while Moshe felt it's totally unnecessary for me to go ahead and tell them uh, and warn them uh, again, I told them already. Uh, so God wanted to tell him, you know, sometimes you tell people, but they don't listen anyway. So that's what he says in the next verse. And how true it is. Hashem. Hashem said to him, look, that's great. Go down anyway. The Olisa Tov Yaron. Yeah, go down. Yolisa Tov Yaron. But then you should go, you and Aaron should come up with you. And uh, he, he he wanted them to, to warn the people again. And the coin of so in this case means the firstborn. And the people are Yesu Lalos of Hashem, they will not push to to ascend the mountain, maybe to view God in a better way. Penny of Frost Point, because maybe they will uh, be killed because of it. Um, it right. yes. Rabbi. Yes. So Hashem is telling Moshe a second time, go and warn the people so right. they don't sin, right? They Correct. don't go over the border. Right. So, it's not, yeah, good. Right? He's very um, solicitous. 
right? So oh, why yeah. did he tell Moshe to hurry down after, you know, in 40 days, uh, just a little while sooner? So if he was so solicitous, because then the, the Jews were getting so anxious, right? Yeah, well, so why why does he step in there and doesn't step in after? Over that? here. Um, <laughs> um, I don't have an answer yet, but maybe, let me see here. Uh, uh, because he wants to be protective. He doesn't want them to go over the boundary. In this case- so You might say, that to, why not Shem go ahead and tell him to go down a little earlier so that, so he would not worship the, uh, right. the golden calf? Uh, a good question. I, I didn't ever saw the, that question, but I'm, as it stands now, I don't have a good answer. I got to think about it, but I think I, I like that question. Pretty good question. Uh, I don't know. Good. Uh, okay. I'm, okay. Now it says, Verse 25, we're up to. By Moshe Alam, Moshe descended the mountain to the people, and he said to them, what did he say? So the, the Torah doesn't say, obviously, Rashi brings it down. What did he say to them? Asrozu, another. Oh, he warned them a second time. So we learn through here that sometimes you have to warn a person before the act and right close to the act, not to do some, whatever the warning is. You just can't rely on, a, on one warning. And, and that's what we see from over here. Okay. <laughs> but now, we're in verse, chapter 20 begins that, I suppose, extremely important section, which we, the, the beginning of the, of the Aseret HaDebrot. And although people call it the Ten Commandments, you've heard me say it so many times, that that's the wrong translation. What is the correct translation of Aseret HaDebrot? Ten statements. Right, ten, 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 ten statements or ten utterances. That's what it was, because as you can see, there's many more um, commandments than ten. There's more than ten. Okay. Uh, um, and the first thing starts like this. Anochi Hashem alotecha. I am the Hashem, your God. Asher hotzeitzicha me'eres mitzrayim yudesavadim. I brought you forth from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. Okay, now, what is the usual term used, uh, what's the usual word we use when we say I? What, Sabian? Ani. Ani, right? Ani. Why does it say Ani? Anochi. Anochi. Well, here's Anochi, right? Well, uh -huh. What's the difference? Why does it say, excuse me, why does it say Anochi over here? And lots of different Excuse me? It's more assertive. It's, it's, it's more what? It's more assertive. Assertive, some place, possibly. Some place I read that Anochi was an Egyptian god. Right. Uh, no, no, Egyptian word. Egyptian I don't know about a word. god. Anochi yeah. was an Egyptian word. But then again, why why use the first word? of the Sarah said there was to use an Egyptian word. Okay. Uh, usually Anochi also means the essence. I, my whole essence. And and what I and what I all the miracles that I performed in Egypt, you have you have witnessed. So it's when Nochi means showing his power and is the, the essence of God and the ability to do something. And he is simply I. That's what some say. Others want to say that it's an acronym. And and the Gemara brings brings the following. It says the following. Uh, How do you know that acronyms are used in the Torah? You would say, you know, things like that. Shenema Anochi Hashem Lotechas is Anochi, and the and not the usual form of Ani. And it says the it's an acronym for four words. The Aleph stands for Ana, which means I. The Nun is Nafshi, my own soul, my whole my whole essence. And the Kaf stands for Ksibat, I wrote the Torah, and the Yud Yehavit, and I gave the Torah. So within the Anochi, it's an acronym of the essence of God. And 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 when he gave us it, was like so to speak, he's giving his whole soul to us. He's so, showing the, the what he demands of us, and it's written and given to us. And uh, and since we saw the great miracles and wonders that he was able to perform, if so facto, you have a right to accept me as a god. And that's that's what Quintin's one interpretation what the word Anochi means, um, right? Uh, And of course, we've said this many times. 
it says an ob. Then it says Hashem alokecha. What is the difference between Hashem and what is the alokim or alokecha? We mentioned this many times. Say Baruch Atu Hashem alokeinu. When we use Hashem, what does that mean? Hashem. You know, compassion, right? Rachamim. It's compassionate. And when you see alokim, it means judgment. 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 So the thing is Hashem alokim. It means he merges the two together, he mingles the two together. So he's not totally um, strict when he uh, when he has to judge some, somebody severely, uh, but on the other hand, he's not totally merciful because he, to be totally merciful, you'll be getting away with everything. So it's like it's a, a mixture, it's a blend between the two, between God compassion with just with with judgment, judgment with compassion. That's what the, the word Hashem Alokecha means. And notice, oh yeah, another important thing is when God is addressing us. He's not addressing us in the plural. He doesn't say, Oh no, Hashem Lokechem. Lokechem would be you, you, plural. I am you, plural, your, your God. It says, Oh no, Hashem Lokechem means I am your singular God. I'm your God in a singular way. So what does that tell us? Why does he, why does he speak in the plural? He's speaking to 600,000 people or more than that. Why is he speaking in the singular? I am your, I'm the Lord your God in the singular. And not in the plural. So sometimes they find it says, it's in the plural. But here it's in the singular. He and wants he, every person to feel that Hashem is his God. Right. You, you're correct. That everyone said he, he individualized it. That everyone, every person to feel he's speaking to him with the heart. Um, uh, see? And Okay. And the, the, old, the old question that we brought up this question many times. Um, why didn't it say, I am Hashem who created the world? Now he's creating the nation. Here, he's, here well, we, he created, so, so what are you trying to say? But, he, but more than that, why was he saying, I am Hashem, you know? Who knew your father, right? Uh, Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. That was in the, uh, the Shira. And when he talks to Moshe. And when he said, when he said a K of B from uh, in the Shira, the Shira, the song of Moshe, it also says, this, you are my, this is my God and I will exalt him, the God mm -hmm. of our fathers. Mm -hmm. that, that's what you find in the Shira. But over here. I, I, well, that's what he said to Moshe at the burning bush. He said, the burning bush, that same, uh, let me see. He said that uh, he spoke in this. He said, I'm the God of your Moshe. father. He said it at the burning bush. Yeah, I think you're right on that one. Yeah, um, exactly what it says. Yeah, he said, I'm, I'm quoting it. Yeah, in chapter three, verse six, it says, At the burning bush, it says, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Yeah, that's what he says by the burning bush. Um, that's that's the, the word that I was using. So it says, "What well, we uh, well, he's a God of history, so to speak." I'm not. I'm I'm here for all the time. I I knew your your, your ancestors going way back. Okay, but here it's a little different. He speaks. Individually, at least every person should feel like God was still speaking to me individually. Okay. So why does he yeah. say I? Why doesn't he say I'm the God who created the world? Oh, oh, I get that to that question. I believe he gives an answer to that. He says that the reason he doesn't say that because none of us. Witness the actual creation of the world, but you, but the, the people present over here at Mount Sinai they all witness the the uh, the plagues and the splitting of the Red Sea, the Red Sea. So there were eyewitnesses to it. So therefore, he he uh, goes ahead and, and says, "I'm the one who took you out of Egypt," and doesn't say, "I'm the one who created the world." You, who, you they weren't there. Nobody was there. Yet they would they could testify to the accuracy of the statement. Okay. That's what Rabbi Huda Levi says. Now, oh, there's a whole Yerushalmi. It's a very interesting uh, commentary 
that's brought down in Yerushalmi, where Yerushalmi states that all the, the, all these ten utterances are alluded to in the Shema Yisrael that we recite every single day. There is they, the Yerushalmi is trying to associate the ten utterances with Shema Yisrael. Look what it says. It's I bet somebody answers you can know too. Omar Rabbi Levi. Rabbi Levi says the following. This is a Yerushalmi. We pray ma korin parshios kriya shema b'chol yom. Why do we recite the kriya shema every single day? And the answer he gives, we pray shasiras has the borim kulam b'hem. Of course, all the ten utterances that are mentioned over here are alluded to in the Shema Yisrael. For example, well, this I think you should know. Where do you find the concept of I am I know Hashem I am the Lord your God and the and the Shema Yisrael. Man, that's an easy one. Where do you see a concept like that? Hmm? What's the first sentence of the Shema Israel? Shema Israel, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Oh. Right? I'm a hero. Is I'm I'm the Lord your God. So that relates to the first um, utterance of you. I am the Lord your God. Then you have the second one. Lo yelachodim achirin. You cannot have God, any other gods. Gods of other, other people think uh, they believe in other gods. In the same verse. Here is the Lord of the God, Hashem Echad. I'm the only one. Now I have, there's no other gods or, uh, uh, in the in the world, even though people might consider them as gods. Okay, but that means Hashem Echad. God is one. Uh, now it says the next thing in the it says you should not take the name of God in vain. And it says uh, well, this is not exactly, but it's just in the, the yeah, good. You have to Hashem to love God. So how does that relate to do not swear falsely? Do not take the name of God in vain. If you right, love somebody, you won't swear falsely. Correct. That's exactly what the Yusham says. Great. Man, the rocky mouth of you love somebody, you love your leader. Lo, Mr. you will not use his name and swear falsely. Very good. Okay, here's another thing. The next one was the Remember the Sabbath. Where do we have an allusion to it in our recitation of the Shema? That you'll obey my mitzvot and you'll keep my mitzvot. Uh, well. <clears throat> No, he says like this. Well, nearly right. Yeah, it says in the last paragraph of the Sitzes paragraph, it says, mm-hmm. You should remember. And the same thing would remember. Remember the Sabbath? Remember. To perform all my mitzvot. Rabbi Omer, to mitzvot Shabbos. That refers to the mitzvot Shabbos. To shkulek and economist a mitzvot Torah. That it's equal to all the mitzvahs of the Torah. Why is Shabbat so special? How what, what, what is so special about Shabbat that it carries so much weight that uh, it's like equal to all the mitzvahs in the Torah? It's time when we contemplate Hashem. And hey, the time to what? When we contemplate Hashem. We yeah, start good. following things and we start going to meet Hashem, more spiritual. That's right, because it's such a special day. Right, correct. Um, uh, now, the next one is, Oh, yeah. I went, according to the Torah, it says in the, over here, it says, you honor your parents, your father and mother, in order that your days will be prolonged. That's what it says over here. So where do we have a similar thing in the, in the Shema Yisrael that deals with prolonging the days? Remember at the end if of the you second, do what I say, right? In Tishmo, if you're right, if you obey all my commandments, you'll have harvest and you're right, you'll yes. be able to live a good life. Uh, but at the end, it says, at the end of the second paragraph of Shema, the man yirbu kemechem bimevenechem, so that your days will be prolonged. So it's, yeah, it's just an allusion to the idea of, of honoring parents where we promise longevity. Oh, now. Below Tirzach, you shall not murder. Where do we have some a, a hint to it 
and the Shema. All these are sins. Well, it says, Vavadatem Mehiro, you will be driven out quickly from this good land. Vavadatem, you destroyed, driven out from the land. And so it says, Vavadatem Mehiro, quickly driven out. Man de Kotil Miskatel. Okay. The one who kills will be killed himself. Uh, they, they will, they will be, one who murders will be killed eventually. Okay. Uh, that's not, well, it's just an illusion, I suppose. It doesn't really say it clearly. Ah, low enough to not commit adultery. That's a little harder one. And the, in the Pasha Sitsis, what does it say about, about the Pasha Sitsis? Lo so suru do not turn after your heart and your eyes and start thinking about uh, um, to, to be to have relations with people you should if you're a married person you have to have relations with another woman and so on okay low to no do not steal because in the Shema it says your safta digonecha you gather your harvest your oil and your your wine. Yours has to be and not somebody else's. Um, and it says, Lo sane brecha it shokeh. And over here it says, you should not bear false witness to somebody else. And it says, in the last three words of the Pasha, it says, I am a God who is, I am your God. And in Yemiyot, it says a similar word, but a similar phrase with one extra word. Hashem Elohim, MS. God is truthful. Uh, okay, so uh, not to bear any false witness. It will be a false witness. And finally, it says, do not desire the house of your friend, or its property, and covet uh, it, and so on. And the, the Yishami says, well, it says here, inscribe it on the uh, with a, on the doorpost of your house oh, and on your uh, your uh, gates, uh, your gates. It has to be yours, and not somebody else's. So again, this is interesting how Yishami tries to equate the Aseris Adiros, the ten utterances, with the recitation of the Shema. And those are some of the allusions to it. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go further. It says, I am the Lord your God, who took you out of er the land of Egypt, the base of Odim, from the house of bondage. Okay. Hmm. Uh, it's also an interesting Gemara in Shabbos that, you know, it wasn't so easy just to get the Torah. You know, Moshe Rabbein is going up there. He had a little problems. The Malachim, you know, the angels did not like the idea that God should give the Torah to human beings. They felt it belongs up in the heavens. And look what the Gemara in Shabbos, the, uh, it's page 58, the second part, portfolio B. Anyway, look what it says. Amar Rabbi Levi. This is more of a, a, a little story uh, uh, that took place when Moshe Rabbeinu went up to Har Sinai. Rabbi Shuba says, but, but Yeshua ben Levi says the following. Moshe when Moshe ascended to the heavens, the Kabbalah is the Torah. He received the Torah from God. Omru The ministering angels said before God, Rebono Shalom, the Rebono Shalom, master of the world. This precious Torah that's up here in the heaven, it's so precious. You want to give it to a human being of flesh and blood? This is what. It, it, it's, it's, it doesn't belong to him. Okay. It, it, it seems like the Malachim gave a little trouble to, to God. In fact, where else do you find that? Where the angels gave God a little trouble when he wanted to do something. Here also they give him trouble when he wants to give the Torah to, to, um, uh, to, to Israel. What happened in the creation of man? Going back to the beginning. Even then, when God wanted to create human beings, the Malachim disagreed. He said, God, what are you doing? How can you create human beings? There's no sin. They're not going to, uh, yeah, they'll do some missiles, but a lot of people are not are there, are wicked and they'll do evil things. And God overrode what they said. And he says, I'm doing it because of the good people. So same thing over here. Uh, the Malachim are telling God, what are you doing? The Torah is so precious, you're giving it to man, to human beings. Don't do it. 
Okay. Amalak uh, Kosh Baruch Moshe. God Himself doesn't answer it. He says, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe, Hachazel Lehem Teshuvah. You give them an answer. You should have an answer to that question and to tell them why I should give the Torah to you. Amalahem. So Moshe Rabbeinu said he had a good answer. He said, Torah Zu Makasiba. Look at what the Torah says right over here. I am the Lord of God, took out of Egypt. Tell me, Malachim, flown the Misraim, you're not Did you ever go down to Egypt? Were you ever enslaved? You weren't. Shuba Makasibe, and what else it says? Should not there any other gods before you? So, Klum, Ben Amim, Atem, Shriam, Jehovim, Abodus, Alilim. So, Moshe Rabbeinu posed the question to the angel Are you, do you live among alien people who are trying to, to persuade you uh, to, to worship other gods? It doesn't apply to you. The next thing, what else does it say? Zechor um, Shabbos Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Do you have what's the you do the work up there? You the laboring the whole week that you have to have a Shabbat to rest and, and comfort yourself. What else does it say? You should not say the name of God in vain. Do you have some business uh, uh, problems that you argue with one another, that you have to come to court, and you have to swear in the name of God? You don't have things like that, so that doesn't apply to you either. What else does it say there? It says in the, in the Ten uh, Utterances, honor your father or mother. Mothers and, mothers and fathers. Do you have parents? You don't have this. That doesn't apply to you either. Not to steal, not to murder, not to do adultery, not to kidnap, and so on. So that, so then Moshe Rabbeinu said to them, do you have any desires for that? Do you have an evil inclination? Of course you don't have it. So immediately, Miyat, after the Malachim heard Moshe Rabbeinu's replies to, what, to everything that's, that is said here in the Ten Utterances, Hodu Miyat, Hodu Lachodesh Baruch and the Malachim agreed, oh, yeah, you're right. The Torah can't apply to us. God, you have the full right to give it to the people. So this is uh, whether actually it's happened or not. It's, uh, similar things might happen. I don't know. But the Gemara does bring this down, that it, was, it wasn't so easy for, for God to go ahead and give the Torah to us. He had some opposition. And, uh, and finally, it's interesting, he wanted Moshe Rabbeinu to answer the questions. And Moshe Rabbeinu did so in a in a in a correct way. That's brought down in Shabbos. If you have a, you have a Why do you ask a lot of nations before us who didn't that's, want it? Right. That's another thing. Yes. Right. So that I means that would apply to them too. They right? <laughs> all these things. They don't. But they rejected, rejected it anyway. But as you're right, they, God did go to or sent messengers, I suppose, to the various countries if they want to. Um, uh, yeah. So what's written in it? Only one guy said, "Well, you can't steal." Oh, come on! We we live by stealing. We we it's we it doesn't apply to us. We can't take it. Uh, uh, you shall not murder. Oh, that's our. We live like that. We kill one another. <laughs> no good. Okay. So it had reasons for not accepting it, uh, and only Bnei Israel did so. Okay, that's true. Oh, where are we now? Oh, next thing. Oh yeah, yeah. Talking about. I think I brought up this question before. Uh, we say there are ten utterances, there's mitzvahs. What mitzvah is that first thing? What is it saying? I am the Lord your God who took out of Egypt. What mitzvah do you have? Is that a mitzvah? It appears simply like a declarative statement. It's just openly stated. That's what it appears to be. Or is it a mitzvah? Or so, what is the mitzvah? So it's a homach locus, the dispute among our commentators. Some say it's like a preamble. You had the preamble to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. The same thing over here. It's like a preamble. I, this is like a given. I'm the Lord your God. And now that you, I'm the Lord your God, you must accept my mitzvot. Others say it's, it's, it's not just a, a declarative statement. Within that declarative statement, it alludes to a mitzvah of the belief in God. And Munah Hashem. So the point many that it doesn't say it exactly that, but that's what the, but that's what the inference is. Since I am the Lord your God, you must accept me as the, as your God. You believe in the, the, the oneness of God. Uh, that's what uh, 
some of the uh, commentators say. Okay. Uh, uh, verse three. Lo yelecho Elohim acherim aponai, which shall not be to you any, well, they always translate uh, other gods before me. There's no other gods before me, but that's really not a good translation because you say, if you're going to say this, you should not have any other gods before me, you're assuming that there must be, other, that there are other gods. But it doesn't mean that. It means gods of others. You cannot accept any god that any other people worship. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see. Uh, it was Rashi well, say that? Said you cannot accept any uh, gods that other people worship. Right, that's said correct. That there were other gods. No, so, so, so you don't translate other gods. It should not be into you, or do not accept for yourself other uh, gods of others, gods of other people. Well, th so that's what it's so he's saying. He's admitting that there are go other gods. No, no, he would say if if you translate it, there should not be any other god before me. Then you're saying there are others, but I'm saying over here, I'm saying others believe in, in as that they're gods, gods, gods of others, not other gods, but others believe as their god. That's what it means. Not that that they we don't accept it as God. Yeah, that, that's the way it's it, interpreted. Um, uh, in fact, this is what the Mechilta says. If I would just translate, you shall not have other gods before me. Are they really, are they really gods then? If you translate that, you're admitting that there's some other gods. So, the Shai says, there are no other gods. It means that others call them gods. Of course, we don't accept it. So, it's really the right translation to me, there should not be to you other people's gods. That would be something translation like that. So I'm not saying we're not calling them gods, others call them gods. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, some more colors also. Okay. And one more question. Losa Silaho Fessel. Now you cannot make yourself any image, any idol, call someone or any picture. That you want to look at that picture and observe it as a God, whether Asher Bashemayim Imal, whether it's in the heavens above, Asher Baras Mitachas, or in the land beneath, Asher Bashemayim Tachas, or in the water, underneath the water, underneath the earth. So even you cannot make any image of these things. Uh, it used to be in about the sorrow with the when the uh, the, the, the worship of other gods, idolatry. They used to make. Uh, Symbols of the sun, of the moon, uh, have idols, and they used to pray to that. So all these things were, were prohibited uh, to us. They used to worship the sun, or the moon, and stars, and the zodiac signs, and so on. Okay. Okay. Or, or the water, and fish, or whatever it be, like we, like I know the Philistines. Uh, we have that they believed in Agon, the fish god, Agon. And uh, why did they have a fish to represent their god? Uh, because they were fishermen and they were involved in fish uh, in the, in the fish industry. Uh, you know, Philistine, the Philistine were not one of the seven Canaanite nations, but they started to inhabit the area by the Mediterranean Sea uh, where Israel borders the Mediterranean Sea. They, they inherit, they Started, they came from, I think they came from Greece around that area, and they came down and inhabited that area, and they became fishermen. And the god was the bone, the fish god. Okay. So all these things they uh, they they would do, even females, they used to have female gods too, not just male gods. The Asherah. What was Asherah? That's another god they talk about in the Torah. Tree. Wasn't uh, it a tree? God. Either way, and it was a female god. Asherah is, is feminine. It was a female god. And they did certain, they worshiped it in a certain way, and they thought by doing so, they their yield would be so much better. That some say the tree, they, they designated a tree as the god, or some say they put a form of a female goddess of some sort at the bottom of the tree, and they, they, they had their certain service, and by doing so, they believed the yield would be very good. So all these things 
that was so common, especially in those days, we are pre prohibited from doing. You only have to believe in one God, and that's it. Finished. Uh, okay, the one more verse. Uh, no, no, let's stop here because the other one gets into more, more complicated. All right, so we'll stop here and we'll continue with the Shem next Tuesday. So, Shabbat Shalom to all of you. Shabbat Shalom. Oh, yeah, yeah, tomorrow's Laba Omer. I mentioned it on Tuesday. You're allowed to get haircuts. I, I, now, if you have your customers from Pesach until now, you did not take your haircuts or anything like that, you could do from now on. After, from Magba Omer on, you could do it. There's another custom that they you break it up. Where they they uh, take haircuts from Pesach until Rosh Chodesh year. And from Rosh Chodesh year to La Boma, no haircuts. La Boma have haircuts. And then after that, from uh, the 34th day of the Omer until, uh, until Sivan, they don't have haircuts. So it depends upon your custom. If you did not cut your hair this whole period from Pesach until now, you could go ahead and do it from now on, starting for tomorrow. There was an article. There was an article in the Algam. I think it was Algamain, or I don't remember which newspaper, saying this marine biologist found proof of the kingdom of Solomon because there was no one ever found any archaeology remnant or anything of yeah. the kingdom of Solomon. They, he discovered that Tarshish. Nobody knew where it was. Oh, yeah, that's they didn't know. Yeah. They, they know that Tarshish, Tarshish, Tarshish right, they know. in Spain. Solomon sent he was um had was very good friends with the Phoenicians. Right, that's they were right? great and the the Phoenicians were sailors, and he sent them to Spain to get silver from this city, Huelva, also known as Tashish, and they found coins of Solomon there. Really? Mentioning, they, yeah. There's always been a question mark. They didn't know exactly know where Tarshish was. Yeah. It might be some thought it was in Africa somewhere. It's, okay, maybe it is in Spain. Uh, very nice. Uh, they just know that I think they found the, a symbol somewhere. Is a Tarshish, one of the coins that had a ship on it with fish. Uh -huh. Did they find a, a, a coin like that with fish on it? Because I think I read somewhere that they found, a, uh, I don't know if it was in Spain, but they found something they that... Uh, that we believe it comes from the city of Tarshish, but there wasn't. I'll see if I can find the article again. Yeah, this because uh, uh, yes, uh, yeah. All right, I'd like to see the article if you have it. Okay. Okay, so Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. We will continue with the Aser Tadi Bro. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Feel good. Thank you. Okay. Bye. <laughs> well, what's he did? Anything else? Does he have to looking for anything else tonight? <laughs>